Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome to Wellesley Mennonite Church. Uh, we have been many places this week and experienced many things. We have come from different directions and many miles, but we are all here the same this morning to worship and hopefully eager to spend some time together. Whether here in person, listening via Zoom, or coming online with YouTube, we welcome you. This will come as a surprise, but I often listen to the Golf Channel on Sirius Radio. It's actually easier to listen to golf than to play it. Um, <laughs> but there's one particular golf show uh, in the mornings, um, and, the, and there, it works on word of the day. I don't know, maybe some of you are familiar with that channel. Um, anyways, you take a word and make all sorts of golf and life applications. <clears throat> as I was prepping the congregational prayer for this week and pondering being worship leader, <clears throat> two words of the day popped into my mind. The words that came to my mind when I was thinking of Wellesley Mennonite was transition and time. And whether you are young or old, employed or retired, male or female, we are all constantly working through transition. It's inevitable. The same way passing time is, is inevitable. Sometimes transition can be good, <clears throat> and sometimes it can put a lot of pressure and demands on us. It can weigh us down, and we, need, and we need help. In the congregational prayer this week, I found a couple scriptures that may help us get, get, get us through this. If you have not read it yet, I'm encouraging you to take a look at some of the verses and help that I found that will help with the transition and passing of time. Hey, we even here at Wells and Manning are in the midst of transition. It's happened before, and we got through it, and it will happen again. We are happy that you have set aside time today to refresh and rejuvenate and to catch up with each other. I'm always amazed how many people stick around after and get caught up, um, and that's, that's great. You are welcome to stick around and catch up. We welcome you to put aside the busyness, challenges, and rushing of the week and allow for some time of refreshment both spiritually and physically. Thanks to all those that make things happen here. Susan for putting the info page together, Anson and Johnny for their technical abilities and support, the music team, and also Paul for bringing us the message. Announcements for this morning. Um, for the summer uh, worship schedule um, is posted on there. The next one is August 4th weekend. We'll be worshiping at Cross Hill Mennonite, and Paul will be speaking. Also a reminder of the community barbecue um, and it's back, and it's, it's in September, September 14th, so please mark that on your calendars. Susan is away this week, uh, and, if you need, and if needs be, thank you to the trustee committee for getting this done. I was always nervous driving in here without lines. I didn't quite know how to park, but we got it straight, so that, that was good. So, and I believe uh, we have an announcement. Jamie wants to make an announcement. Yes, I had trouble parking between the lines this morning, so I'm not sure which was worse. <laughs> um, thank you for your words of the day, uh, time and transition. I hope that through this summer season, you are having a restful time, because once the calendar turns to September, we will be having a busy time here in the congregation with lots of transitions. So we have uh, finalized our agreement with Matthew Bailey Dick, and his first Sunday with us will be September 22nd. Uh, he will begin his employment the week before that. That means that uh, Paul's last Sunday with us will be September 15th, and we will plan uh, appropriate time of transitioning and celebration uh, for all of the goodness that God has uh, bestowed upon us through this transition time. and. Uh, Paul has been a real blessing and a, an answer to prayer. So we, again, thank you, Paul, and, and thanks be to God for God's goodness and God's grace, God's generosity to us as a people, a small group of people here in Wellesley, but a group of people who can make a significant impact on this uh, community and in the world around us. So again, thank you for your ongoing prayers, um, and thanks be to God for the goodness that uh, we are experiencing. Yes, thank you. Um, it's hard to believe that in the course of a year, all the things that have transpired, but God has really been uh, blessed us, and, and uh, so we're thankful for that. <clears throat> for a land acknowledgement today, I offer the following. We are thankful for all those 
who many years ago settled in this area and made a home for themselves and generations to follow. We are thankful for the First Nation and Native people who were here first. In particular, we acknowledge the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the neutral peoples. We are thankful for the ways they both tried to be good stewards of the land for generations. <clears throat> we understand there was hurt and damage caused as time moved along. While we, work, while we work through this reconciliation with our First Nations people, may we try to work ways of right relationships with our Indigenous neighbours. Help us to recognize and somehow work towards a common ground for both parties. May peace reign here. Ask Diane to play a musical interlude as we pour our hearts for worship. Thank you, Dan. That was beautiful. <clears throat> For a call to worship this morning, uh, we're going to be reading from Voices Together, um, and it's from uh, 854 in the Voices Together, but it'll be Sean on the, on the wall for us. So please join me in reading it. Some of us are exhausted. Some of us are curious about Jesus. Some of us are hungry. Some of us are disorientated. Some of us are broken. We gather around you today, O Christ. Grant us your peace. Amen. Join me in prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, God, for the opportunity to be here this morning. We ask that we can park our thoughts and plans our pushes and pulls, our aches and pains, and allow ourselves to be refreshed and rejuvenated. Thank you for keeping us safe and watching over us this week. Whatever transition we have experienced or may be currently experiencing, may we be present here and be ready to be challenged and rejuvenated. Thank you for the many gifts and skills you have blessed our church, both in people and in programs. May this time of worship allow us to pause and learn. Be with all those who lead in worship, and may it all be an honor to you. In, in all this we ask in your name. Amen. I'd invite the music team to come forward for the first hymn, and then we're blessed by a special quartet this morning as well. So I'll ask the music team to come forward. Okay, please stand as we sing together, God who's giving.
seated and Mark's going to join us and we're going to do our best as a quartet. <laughs>
Yes, thanks so much. A very nice way to tune us together into, well, old favorites, and uh, they kind of make the souls sing along. Huh. Suggestion box topics. Someone here was shrewd enough to know that it's a good topic for a short-term interim pastor is money <laughs> and giving. So we're going to pick up on that a little bit, sort of today and next week some more. A little bit more on the money topic and how money works in our lives and the world. And, but today, a little bit also with um, biblical interpretation. But the best way, in my opinion, to talk about giving in particular would be if, let's say, three of you would write out a giving autobiography. A little one, two-page summary of what you've learned about giving and how it's functioned in your life. If we get three volunteers to do that, I'll add mine to the mix. We'll read them all through one Sunday morning anonymously. And I think we would remember it well. There would be things that would be said that would spark, ah, things in our lives. So put that in the back shelf there on your mind. And if you're inspired to do that, I think we probably still have time to do that. And then the other uh, thing I want to pick up from, us from the suggestion box is biblical interpretation. How do we understand what's written in the Bible? There's, um, there's variations on things and how that works, right? But how do we understand what the Bible itself is trying to tell us and then apply it in our lives? So those two topics lined up kind of in my little brain and they said, the widow's might. And you might remember that story or we call it the widow's white might. It's a short story about a widow in uh, giving money to the temple. And it's both in Mark and in Luke. And I have some history with that story. I know that it's meant different things to me at different times in life. And so it presents a bit of a case study in biblical interpretation. So that's what we're going with this morning. I'll tell my history on preaching on this passage and how I've understood it, and then how I understand it now. I've asked Dan to read it with me, and because context is important, we're going to read quite a bit more than this story. This story happens right at the end of Mark chapter 12. And it's important to read the context of what comes before and after that. So uh, as we read, it's a condensed version. We're not putting everything in there. But notice there's a rising tension building up in this chapter. Religious leaders sta uh, stepping up to challenge Jesus and Jesus challenging them right back. Or in fact, the first part is him challenging them. And then in the middle, there's an honest question about what's most important, and then come the story about the widow's might, and then the next chapter talks about Jesus giving notice of the temple's destruction. So Dan and I are going to cover that. Dan, if you want to come, please. Then Jesus began to speak to the chief priests, scribes, and elders in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. When they realized that Jesus had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd. So they left him and went away. And then they sent some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus said to them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Some Sadducees, who say there is no re resurrection, came to him and asked him a question about the resurrection. Jesus said to them, Is not this the reason you are wrong, that you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? One of the scribes heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, asked, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus said, The first is, Hear, O Israel, you're the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. 
The scribes said to him, you are right, teacher. This is much more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask Jesus any question. As, as Jesus taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And here's the widow's mite story. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. As, as Jesus came out of the temple, one of, the disciples, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? Jesus said, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Beware that no one leads you astray. Thanks, Dan. So there's Jesus with his disciples in one of the outer courts of the temple. Might be Tuesday, might be Wednesday of the Passion Week. Palm Sunday just happened a few days ago. Good Friday is coming up on the horizon. No one knows that yet but they do know that conflict is ramping up. So here in Mark chapter 12, Jesus tells a parable against the religious leaders of the day, and then they come back at him from multiple directions trying to trip him up, hoping to get Jesus to say something they can hold against him so that they can deal with him um, according to the law. That pauses when a scribe then, listening to this, asks a sincere question about which commandment is most important. And then right after that, it's back to blows again. Now it's Jesus. He's going on a rant, warning the crowd to beware of the teachers of the law who like to walk around and look important, say lengthy prayers, but they devour widows' houses. And then comes today's story, the one we call the widow's mite, Jesus observes what's going on in this temple courtyard. And imagine there was a series of chests, and each of them had some kind of opening that you could drop money into coins that would kind of rattle its way down in there. That's for the, worship, the offerings of the worshipers to come and give money to. And Jesus sees a lot of rich folks pour large amounts in. And then a poor widow comes along, you know? Imagine a homeless person, and she puts two tiny copper coins in, worth, worth less than a penny. She kind of slips in, slips out. No one takes notice. She's probably a bit skittish, would feel like she doesn't really belong there. She certainly knows she doesn't write in this crowd, and she does the opposite of draw attention to herself. Just a quick little on and off stage a completely unremarkable, totally forgettable little event in the history of the world. Except Jesus notices. Jesus notices not only her actions, he also is keenly aware of all the dynamics that are happening in that room. All the socio-religious economic forces, the systemic dysfunctions being played out in that little drama. And he elbows his disciples to pay attention, and he says, I tell you the truth, that widow, she put more in than all the others. They gave out of her their wealth, but she gave out of poverty and put in everything, all she had to live on. 
I wonder what you make of that story. Do you like it or not? How does it make you feel? Which character are you most like? Has that story ever said something important to you or influenced you in some way? When I was a kid in Sunday school, maybe 10-ish years old, I thought this was a stupid story. Ending all wrong. As far as I'm concerned, that widow, she had no business giving all the money she had to live on to the temple, in my mind, the church. That was all backwards. The church should be giving her money to live on. The story should end with Jesus trotting over, reaching into the treasure chest, pulling out a wad of cash or a bunch of coins and giving it to her and telling her, you know, to live happily ever after or something like that. That would have made sense to me. It still does. I never got to preach that sermon as a 10-year-old, but as about a decade later, I was invited to be a lay ministerial candidate in my home church in Winnipeg. That meant I was put on the preaching schedule. And I chose this story as the text for my first official sermon. Over 40 years ago now, and I used this story to say that Jesus noticed the smallest, nearly invisible gifts, the kind that anybody else overlooks, and he calls those the greatest and the most important kind of like a version of the last shall be first. I was obviously playing down the greater visibility of my new position in church, and I found a meaning in this passage that suited my situation. Finding a meaning in a passage that suits our situation can be the Holy Spirit applying it to our lives in a rich and meaningful way. But just as often, it can be us dodging something or twisting that passage into something it really wasn't intended to mean. I have not used that interpretation of this passage since. I think that message aligns with the gospel. It comes in other places in the New Testament, like uh, the many members of the same body passage would be best, but I don't think that's what this story is about. The second time I preached on this story was my first sermon I got paid for. First sermon at Mount Royal Mennonite in Saskatoon after they hired me to be there for a year. It also grew out of my personal situation, which had changed. This story is often used to teach sacrificial giving. I was kind of wrestling with that term, sacrificial giving. I found it leaves a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. Not that I don't know, or I realize all giving is sacrificial, right? You give 10% of your money away, you're going to sacrifice doing something else with that money. So, yeah, giving is sacrificial. But rightly or wrongly, I associated this phrase sacrificial giving with TV-type preachers who have a lot more wealth themselves than those they're trying to squeeze some sacrificial giving out of. I don't like that. Back in Saskatoon, I noticed that Kathy and I had started to accumulate some stuff. We'd been married a year by then, and we owned some furniture, and we wanted more. This widow gave all she had to live on. I was doing the opposite. I was gathering in, so I had more to live on. So I talked about what people from the margins had to teach us about stuff, and all the stuff that we have in our lives and how it accumulates. This widow was like some of the people I saw hanging around the bay in downtown Winnipeg when I worked there. We called them bag ladies at the time, and we noticed them, but not in the way that Jesus noticed this woman. Never thought of them as role models. And yet here Jesus is lifting this widow up, saying that she showed up all the well-dressed other people in the successful temple, courtyard, or downtown Winnipeg folk. And she had something to teach them. She has something to teach me. That's a valid point, also affirmed in the rest of the Bible. And it's good for the Bible to speak to your situation and to see your life in light of it. We trust the Holy Spirit to do that for us. But you could do that multiple times and still miss what the point that a particular passage is actually trying to make. 
People like me need to read some books, have some life experience, get some schooling to get at that. So here's how I've come to see and how I've come to interpret this story in more recent years. First rule of thumb in trying to understand what a particular verse or passage is trying to say is zoom out, take a step back, take a look. What comes before, what comes after? How does this fit into the flow of what's happening here? Who are the people, what are they doing? Who is the person described, I mean, what kind of train of thought is the person trying to bring us along? So let's look before what comes before and what comes after this widow's might story. And let's start with after. The widow's might story comes right at the end of Mark 12. Mark 13 begins with, as you heard us read, Jesus coming out of the temples, one of the disciples saying, wow, Jesus, look at this beautiful buildings. Look at all these big stones. Da -da 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 -da. And Jesus says, you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. So Jesus would have said that at the end of his ministry, somewhere in the early year, you know, maybe year 33 or so. That's when he says the temple will be destroyed. And it was. It was destroyed in the year 70, just about the time Mark is writing his gospel. So at first reading, though, not an obvious connection between this widow and uh, the story about the temple being destroyed. It feels more like an abrupt change of topic, even if the setting, the temple, remains the same. Now look at what comes before the chapter. We've noticed this conflict wrapping up between Jesus and the religious establishment, the scribes, the Pharisees, and their ilk, the keepers of the temple, the keepers of the religious order at the time. There's hardly a page in the Gospels where they aren't bothering Jesus with something or other. And Mark 12 starts out with Jesus sparring with them. He tells a parable against them. And then they try to trap him with various questions. And then as far as we can tell, there's a well-intentioned scribe asking Jesus what the most important commandment is. Good question, right? In the midst of all this squabbling, What's actually important? Does anybody know? Jesus, what do you think? Jesus gets asked this question several times in the Gospels. Always gives the same answer. And he's being asked by, uh, he gets asked that question sometimes by those trying to trip him up. And sometimes it seems like this, somebody actually has an honest question and wants it answered. Or maybe in the back of his mind already thinks he knows the answer but wants it confirmed. But the interesting thing is, either way, these religious experts who are asking Jesus, they actually don't know the answer. His enemies would never ask him the question knowing the answer that's coming because it always leaves them stunned quiet. They have no comeback. And maybe the others had an inkling, but whatever. They want Jesus to answer this question for them. So just pause and let that sink in for a little bit. The keepers of the temple... The religious experts, the teachers of the law, did not know what the most important commandment is. To their credit, they recognize when Jesus says it, love God with all your being, love your neighbor as yourself, and it shuts his, um, the complainants up every time they back off. They back off and Jesus steps up, maybe not surprisingly, with a rant against these teachers of the law, these keepers of the temple, who like to promenade around in these long robes, who like to be shown the best seats in the house, who speak long showy prayers and devour widows' houses. How do you do that? What is that, devour widows' houses? Must be an exaggeration, right? hyperbole. Oh, wait a second. Here comes a widow. What's she? Oh, everything she's got to live on is getting put into the temple treasury. There goes her rent money. There goes her grocery money. There goes all she has to live on. 
is getting devoured by the temple treasury. Hmm. Why would she do that? Doesn't she know what's more important than all the sacrifices and offerings? How could she know? Teachers of the law don't even know. Certainly wouldn't be teaching it, would they? So that's what Jesus notices. That's what he's ranting on about. That's what this layered story is about. It's condemning this corrupt temple system that convinced that poor widow to sacrificially put everything she had into that temple treasury. It's not what God's asking of her. It's what these teachers of the law who don't know what's more important have set up to ask of her. It's saying the temple is doomed. This temple is going to get torn down in the not too distant future. If you're like me, there's an aha moment when the lights go on and you see what the Bible is actually trying to say. Fascinating dynamic in this particular story because Jesus has a way of lifting up this woman who is doing this great sacrificial act even as he's condemning the system that's getting her to do it. Bottom line, turns out this story does not teach about the blessedness of sacrificial giving. This particular woman, yep, there was some blessedness in it for her. But this story does the opposite. It condemns the system that squeezes such sacrifices out of the poor and doesn't tell them what is more important than all those sacrifices and offerings. Learning what the Bible says and means is, can be a lifelong journey. It's a long stretch of time to get to some of those things, often with twists and curves along the way. Sometimes the Spirit uses a story to poke at a spot in our lives, in our faith, that needs attention. That's a beautiful thing. Sometimes that same Spirit takes the same verse and pokes at a different spot in our life that also needs attention. Another beautiful thing. And often it takes a number of years of study and experience to notice what Jesus was actually talking about and what Mark was trying to communicate in chapter 12 in this part of the Bible. Another beautiful thing. And all along the way, there's temptation to use the Bible falsely, to use religion, to serve self, to devour widows' houses. Ill-advised teaching can be skewered out of most every passage by people and religion with self-serving agendas to promote. Even the devil quotes scripture when he tempts Jesus in the desert. That's as old as the Bible itself. Faithful living is lifelong learning, sometimes unlearning, that gains a wisdom of a discernment as we trust the Holy Spirit to see us through with humility and grace. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Jesus, for the gift of your word. And thank you for how it comes alive in our life, for your spirit that uses it to open places in our hearts and in our understanding, to know what it is that you call for us, so that we may know what is most important for us to do, most important for us to be, as we are your followers. Bless us as we take one step at a time further to becoming that which you call us to. We pray with thanksgiving in your holy name. Amen. of the Bible, please stand as you're able.
Thank you, Paul, for that message. Uh, another reminder of the upside down kingdom. Uh, the, the poor disciples, you know, they thought they had a, maybe a cushy job, but that indication that he elbowed them every once in a while, I think we could all use a little shot in the ribs, too. Um, <clears throat> For sharing our offerings, uh, we're trying something a little new. The plate was at the back, and, and now it's been brought to the front. So um, hopefully you read the info page about how that's being done. Um, but if you haven't had a chance to uh, put in your tithe yet, you're welcome to do that later, and nobody will watch you come up to the front. So, <laughs> so I'll add the offertory prayer, a part of the congregational prayer this morning. So please uh, pray with me. God, we are thankful for the ways you have blessed us individually and as a congregation. We are thankful for the way you have been faithful to the life here at Wellesley Mennonite for so many years. <clears throat> we recognize we are one piece of a bigger pie, but we also recognize we may be important to our area here in Wellesley. We want to be faithful in our giving, and we are thankful for the way you continue to bless our activities here at Wellesley. God, we humbly come before you this morning and ask for forgiveness for the areas we may have stumbled through this week. We are thankful for the many ways you have blessed us this week, whether in activity, nature, friends, or family. We are blessed in so many ways. We have many things in common with each other, but there is one thing we have in common more than anything, and that's that we are all moving on in time and are constantly in a state of transition. Whether as young people, young families, starting a new job, working through health issues, retiring, or even in a pastoral search, we are all in a state of transition. For the most part, God, we do well and are satisfied moving along and transitioning through life experiences. For that, God, we give you thanks for blessing us. And sometimes, God, we can feel overwhelmed, frustrated, even scared about these transitions we are involved in. Sometimes we feel like we are doing these things all on our own and not sure where we will get the strength and energy to move forward. These may be the times our boat takes on water and we begin to sink. We would do well to remember how you responded to your disciples when their boat was rocking and taking on water. When times are rocky and life is challenging, we actively seek words of encouragement and support. God, when we are burdened and bogged down with decisions and transitions, may we turn to you and the word where there's much support and words of wisdom that will buoy us and give us strength as we need to get through these times. As we move on with pastoral transition here at Wellesley, we ask that you continue to guide this process. And we ask that you be with Matthew as he continues to work towards serving us here at Wellesley Mennonite. We are thankful for the way you have guided our congregation this past year. Continue to give us wisdom and, and support to Claire and Paul as they currently lead us. Thank you for their leadership. We also that, ask that you would be with those of our group who are continuing to work through health issues. You know who these are you know those who are healing and are in need and we ask that you continue to be with them and give them strength and patience as they work through daily activities god we are thankful for the healing that you have allowed to happen and we thank you for how you will continue to provide healing and we also ask that you continue to be with those who are suffering and dealing with loss give them strength to deal with the deep pain that hurts so deep and seems to resurface at weird times Words and actions often seem so inadequate when trying to support those who have lost a loved one. God, give those who are dealing with loss the hope and grace that only you can give. For the unspoken words and concerns, we ask that you hold those close to you. We know, the, we know you know the hurts and those who are suffering. We ask that you would provide love and care where needed in these situations. And we lift up our households of faith this week. Continue to hold them close to you and give them strength for the challenges they may be facing. We rejoice with them in their life satisfaction. In closing, Lord, we ask that as time moves on and we face transitions in our lives, that you would continue to be with us. Help us to understand that we can't do this all on our own. Help us to lean on you and look to the Bible for support. Grant us strength, strength as we face another week. In your name we ask it. Amen. I ask you to stand as the music team comes forward to lead us in the sending song and stay standing for the benediction.
for the benediction, I'm reading from the Voices Together. This is a really good resource, by the way. But um, I'm reading uh, from uh, 1068. Eternal God, you call us to ventures of which you, we cannot see the ending. By paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown, give us faith to go out with courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Go in peace.